Are you staying cool? <laughs> Man, it's been warm out there, hasn't it? But we are not complaining. We're not complaining because the alternative is not a good one. And it's kind of sad that we're in the middle of June already. I just feel like we just blast through summer and we just keep heading back to winter. <laughs> so you, you know my thoughts about winter. <laughs> Anyhow, we're not here to talk about weather, are we? We're here to bring God glory and exalt Him. And I pray that's what you, your heart is willing to do. So if you would, would you please be present? Would you please uh, just kind of just empty your mind of all the things of the world right now so that we can just spend a few moments worshiping God together and bringing Him His glory. So we will start with doing that by the singing, uh, just singing, uh, opening up our hearts and singing to Him, and then we will jump into the teaching of the Word. So I'm looking forward to being with you, worshiping with you, and I hope you're ready to encounter God and exalt Him and, again, bring Him the glory that He deserves. Blessed are you who are downhearted, tired and weary, and in need of something more. Blessed are you who have had a tough year or season, perhaps filled with ups and downs, sorrow and sadness, misery and mistakes. You are not alone. Blessed are you whose dreams have been interrupted, stomped on, or perhaps just taking too long. There is a new thing right around the corner. Blessed are you who don't know what to believe, or why you are here today. But despite that, you keep pushing forward. Blessed are you who are walking through seasons of prosperity and joy. Celebration and hope. For you have found something truly worthy of sharing. You see, sometimes life is just hard, but blessed are those who seek the Lord in the midst of that darkness. For there is hope, real tangible hope found in Him. So today, May you be reminded that you were created on purpose and for a purpose. May you know that God has big plans for you. Plans to prosper you. And not to harm you. May you walk in truth and light so that no matter where you go, you will have a light onto your path. May you find rest free from anxiety. And may His love which is never ending and His grace which is never failing follow you wherever you may go. For He has come to make all things new.
stadium feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise We'll see you break down everyone We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs are So we are continuing our series here called Heroes. And again, we're going uh, kind of through the Bible this summer, through the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, and identifying some heroes. And we're just kind of extracting some out. We could, um, I mean, there's so many, obviously so many men and women that we could identify as heroes. And maybe we need to do that sometime is go back and kind of do the ones that are a little bit more obscure that we you know, don't normally talk about. Uh, however, uh, this summer we're hitting the, we're kind of hitting the main ones. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about Noah and we talked about how different he was and how he built his life on, and all these heroes, that's what they're doing. They're building their life on the values in which God identi identifies for us. And, um, as we discern those values, God's values, uh, we live those out or people live those out. Heroes lives those out. And so, Noah was an individual that was absolutely different than his culture. Uh, you know, what, 120 years, he's building this boat in his backyard, right? Uh, you can only imagine his neighbors. I mean, he was vastly different, right? Uh, people probably thinking that he was just, uh, you know, had lost it. But nevertheless, he was obeying and doing what God had asked him to do. And then we looked at Abraham and last week we looked at Joseph, and again, each of these individuals within their lives, even though maybe they may be familiar to some of us, maybe they're not familiar to you, but uh, as, you know, as we look at their lives, we see that they're individuals that embrace what God desires for them to do, even though it's different. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy by any means, just like for you and I, God you know, as we are called to be heroes as well, and God wants to work in and through us, um, it, it's, it doesn't make life easy by any means. In fact, it makes it harder because it's we're kind of going upstream. However, it makes our life better. We are, you know, those of us that, that you know, have placed our faith and trust in God and, and we're trying to allow Him to, to, and live out those values within our lives and, and be the people that God has called us to be. Um, it, it does bring life, even though it's very challenging at times because it's different. We're going against our culture. And so that's what we see with a lot of these individuals that we identify as heroes. So this week we're going to look at another hero, and it's going to be by, the guy, by, by a guy by the name of Moses. And, and by the way, I think I shared this with you last week, but... Uh, again, um, there's an upper story taking place, and there's kind of two stories taking place in a sense. we got the upper story and the lower story. The upper story is God's story, which uh, there, he's got this, there is a story that he is unfolding, 
and he's continuing to unfold it. And that's what we read in, you know, through the, throughout Scripture. We read this story coming to fruition. And then we have the lower story, which is how we play into his upper story, if that makes sense. So when we look at these individuals, we look at Noah, we look at Abraham, we look at um, 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 Joseph, and today we're going to look at Moses. Um, we see that their story plays into the upper story. Um, and that's kind of what makes them heroes. So, you know, as we have placed our faith and trust in, into Christ, uh, hopefully we're allowing Him to place us into His upper story because that's what He wants to do. And that's what we see within these individuals. And so today that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at Moses being invited into God's upper story and how that was challenging to him. So as we start, let me just let's uh, start with Exodus. We're going to look at Exodus chapter three uh, and a couple different chapters. Uh, but Exodus chapter three verses nine through ten says this: The Israelites' cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So God's talking to Moses. Uh, if you remember the story, or if you've heard the story, Moses is uh, a shepherd at this point in time in his life. And he sees this bush that's on fire, but yet the fire is not consuming the bush. Now, I'm guessing, just like you and I, that would intrigue us, and we would probably walk over maybe and kind of see what's going on. And so as Moses does that, um, God speaks to him and says, uh, don't come any further. You need to take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. And then God begins to speak to Moses, and he says, my people have cried out to me. They're in Egypt. They're, they're slaves, right? I'm paraphrasing this. But my people have cried out to me, and I've heard them, and I see the way the Egyptians are treating them, um, and I want you to go and to bring them out of Egypt. Now, we would call this Moses' calling. This was Moses' purpose in life. This is, you know, what he was. By the way, I was talking to an individual this week. I was counseling uh, with them, and one of the things that they were struggling with was that, their purpose in life. Um, and they were questioning that. They were trying to figure that out. Now, this person is not, I don't believe, is a Christ follower. They are secular. But, but yeah, that's what they were that's what they were struggling with, was their purpose in life. That's, that's what life is about. And for some of us, if we're not following Jesus, if, if God is not within our lives, uh, we have this conflict. Because it's, what purpose do we have? We think, well, our job's our purpose. And, that, and that's not our purpose, and that's not fulfilling. Just like with her, that's what she was identifying. You know, my job is not fulfilling. Correct, because it's not your identity. It's not your purpose. It's not what you were created for. And so when... But, you know, when we live in our purpose, that's, you know, we, we discover that. that. We can call that a calling, maybe. You know, Moses is calling here. God is saying, this is what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to be a deliverer. But what's really interesting is, even, uh, you know, with Moses, even though he, I think he believed, under, knew who Yahweh was, and we're going to get to that here in just a moment, he was struggling with this calling. And, it, and throughout uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4, uh, Moses questions God as God is calling him. God's saying, I want you to go. I'm sending you. And Moses says this in chapter 3, verse 11. He said, it says, Moses asked God, who am I that I should go? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And Moses was questioning, you know, who am I, God? Who am I? You know, what, what's so special about me? Why, why me? Why, why, what, what is it about me? Now, I would invite you this week to further read in chapter 3 and chapter 4 and read how God answered those. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I want to take it a little bit different direction today. But I would invite you to go and, and, and read God's answer back to Moses in each of, these, uh, each of Moses' questions. So Moses is struggling with this calling. He's like, who am I? Who am I that I should go? And then, in, and then in verse 13, just a couple more verses, Moses asks another question. He says this, If I go to the Israelites and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is His name? What should I tell them? Okay? What should I tell them? See, Moses is struggling here. He's, you know, he's struggling with his, his calling. 
he's having reservations. He's he's having doubts and thoughts, and you know, and, and it, just like us, and, and, and we'll talk about that. But just like us as humans, some uh, many times we struggle with that calling when God comes to us and says, "This is what I created you to do. This is what I created you to be. This is your purpose." Well, who am I? And if I do this, what should I tell them? How, what should I say? Chapter 4, verse 1, he said, Moses asks another question, and he says, What if they won't believe me and will not obey me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you? Now, then what do I do? What if they don't believe me, God? And then in verse 10 of chapter 4, he says, Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, either in the past or recently or since you have been speaking to your servant, because I am slow and hesitant in speech. Some people have said that he stuttered, that he had an issue with stuttering. And he's, Moses is saying, look, I, you know, I, I, I can't speak well. And then in verse 13 of chapter 4, like many, of, like many people, please, Lord, just send someone else. Please send someone else. And I think we can all identify with Moses and what he was experiencing. Who am I? Who am I? What if they don't believe me? When I go and I talk to them, what, you know, what, 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 who do I tell them? Who do I tell them, you know, your name? You want me to go and deliver this message, but what do I, you know, what, who do I tell sent me? And then what if they don't believe me? And, and, and then on top of that, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not eloquent in my speech. I don't, I don't know how to put it together. God, would you please just send someone else? But here's the deal. Even though Moses, and just like you and I at times, think that we are not the right candidate, God knows. God knows that we're the perfect candidate. This is what He created us to do. This is the very purpose that He has for us when He comes to us and calls us and gives us a calling, a purpose, however you want to word that. And again, I get it. Just like Moses, I get as humans, we can struggle with that at times. But here's the... So, you know, so we can identify with that. And we can then question, I, I'm just not your guy. I'm just not your person, God. Could you send someone else? I'm just not the right candidate. But here is the deal. Moses was the perfect candidate. And when God calls us in, when God calls us for a purpose, when God shares with us what it is that He wants us to do, the purpose that He has for us, we are the perfect candidate, even though we may not believe it, even though we may doubt, even though we may have hesitations, even though we may have insecurities and fear about it. We are the perfect candidate. Now let me share with you how Moses was the perfect candidate candidate. Okay? So God is telling him um, to go. He's heard his children, his, you know, the Israelites that are in Egypt. Remember, Joseph went into Egypt as one individual and the, they exponentially grew. Okay? Last week we talked about his family uh, coming and then the nation just continued to grow. And so the first thing is this, Moses was raised in the palace. For 40 years, Moses was raised in the palace. Let me give you just a little bit of backstory. Now, if you, and some of you are familiar with it, uh, and if you are, just humor me, but you know, the, so Joseph goes in as one, right? And then his brothers come, there's a famine, and then his family comes over for some food. And Joseph is over, he's second in command to Pharaoh, but his leadership was really over the food distribution. And you remember he interpreted the dreams to say, hey, Egypt's going to be very uh, blessed and plentiful, bountiful for seven years, and then we're going to have seven years of, of a famine. And that's exactly what happened. And Moses, or Joseph said, we need to plan for that. And so uh, Joseph... <laughs> Joseph uh, was in charge of the food distribution. So his family comes during this famine. He recognizes his family, as we talked last week, and then he brings his family over. The nation then, be God began to grow. Remember, God made a promise to Abraham, a covenant to say, I'm going to make you into a great nation. So this is the upper story taking place. And now these, these people are growing. So his family turns into about 
a million or over a million. And now that's the workforce of Egypt. It had grown exponentially. It had grown so much, the, this, the Hebrews, the Israelites, had grown so much that the Egyptian midwives went to the Pharaoh and began to complain. And they began to say, look, these Hebrew women, these Hebrew women are having children like crazy. You know, and so what happened was they started feeling a little bit insecure. They started to feel a little bit. The Pharaoh started feeling a little bit uh, fearful that that these this this group of people could could take over because they are growing so much. And so he puts out a decree that says, "Kill all of the male children." Now again, we see Satan working behind the scenes because he knows that Jesus is coming into the picture, the Messiah. He doesn't know when, but he knows that something's going to happen. So you can see Jesus, or you can see uh, Satan in here, uh, his plan. And so uh, he, the Pharaoh makes a decree that every male Hebrew child should be born, and, or that's born should be killed. But um, God protected the Hebrews. And this is what's so interesting. So Moses' mother, okay, she has Moses, right? And she, and she hides him for about three months, and then she can't hide him any longer. And she's trying to figure out what to do. So then she sees uh, Pharaoh's daughter down by the river bathing, and so she creates this little basket or whatever, places Moses in it, and sends it down the river, in which it, uh, Moses is intercepted by Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter has compassion over Moses, uh, the, the, the child, and she takes him in. And then, this is where the story gets really good, er, <laughs> she summons a Hebrew woman to be a midwife. And who do you think she gets to be the midwife? Moses' mother, literally. So now you have Moses' mother that's living in the palace too, in a sense, or, you know, I don't know if she's living in the palace, but she is raising Moses. What do you think she's teaching Moses? She's teaching him the ways of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob and Joseph, the God of the covenant. Let me just say this. It's by coincidence that they actually got Moses' birth mother, right? I don't believe in, I don't believe in coincidences. This is all God. And so therefore... If you're tracking along, Moses is being raised in the palace for 40 years. Okay? Now, put a pin right there, okay? Because he is the perfect candidate. And at the end, I'm going to kind of summarize it all up. So, as Moses, as Moses is growing up in the palace, at some point in that 40 years, at the end of that 40 years, Moses understands that he is a Hebrew, that he's an Israelite, that he is a Hebrew. And so one day he's, um, one day he's, he's out and he sees an Egyptian beating on one of his people, a Hebrew person, a Hebrew, okay? And he goes over and he intervenes and he ends up killing the Egyptian. And then what happens is uh, the next day there's a couple of Hebrews that are fighting or something and he goes and breaks that up. And one of them says, what are you going to do? Kill us and hide us in the sand? Paraphrasing here. Kill us and hide us like you did the Egyptian. And Moses is, is scared. He's scared because he, he's, he's found out, right? He, you know, and so he runs because now Pharaoh wants to kill him. All right, they go back and they report it to Pharaoh. Somehow he finds out and then Pharaoh is headhunting. The Pharaoh at that time is headhunting Moses. And so now Moses runs, he flees, now he's a fugitive, and he's going to be a shepherd, and this is going to be the second part of his life for another 40 years, okay? The first 40 years he spent in the palace, and now the next 40 years he's going to be a fugitive and a shepherd. So while he was, so as he go in Exodus chapter 2, verse 15, it says this, when Pharaoh heard about this, meaning that he killed the Egyptian, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian, and sat down by a well. And as he's sitting by this well, there were some shepherds that came through with, a flock, with, some, with some sheep, with a flock of sheep, and Moses helps them to get water. He helps them uh, get water for their sheep. And as the, when they go back, they report to the owner and tell him what the, that this individual by the name of Moses helped them get water. And then this guy, uh, his name is Jethro or Reuel, 
Reuel is, 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 is another name that he was referred to as. But Jethro is the owner of these sheep. He tells them to go get Moses. If this guy was that helpful, why don't you go get him? And so they go and they get him. And Moses comes and he begins to live with Jethro and he watches over, he tends to some of Jethro's sheep. So now he's a shepherd. He's a fugitive running from Egypt, but now he's a shepherd watching over Jethro's sheep. Later, he would marry one of Jethro's daughter by the name of Zipporah. And what's really interesting, another coincidence, is that Midian, this place where he was at, Midian, is, is an interesting area where he was a shepherd for his father-in-law's sheep, Jethro's sheep, right? And in this area, this Midian, this area where he tended Jethro's sheep, there was this mountain there called Mount Horeb. Another name for Mount Horeb is Mount Sinai. This is the exact place God would lead His people to after the Exodus. This area, therefore, for 40 years where, Je where Moses tended, attended Jethro's sheep, would be very familiar, extremely familiar to Moses. Again, Coincidence? Another coincidence. Moses was the perfect candidate for what God was calling him to do. One more area of, uh, one more stage of Moses' life. So he goes from living in the palace for 40 years, which meant he would have known Egypt. He would have known the whole area. He would have known everything, right? That's where he lived. He would have known Pharaoh. He would have known uh, various pharaohs. He would have, he would have known them. Okay, they would have been familiar. The whole system would have been familiar to Moses. The area in which God was going to take his people out of Egypt and that area to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, was the area in which Moses spent 40 years attending his father in law's sheep. It would have been extremely familiar too. And then the last stage of his life, he would be a deliverer for 40 years. Moses' heart had been captured by God, by Yahweh. Even though he questioned, he did go. Even though he questioned, he did follow through and do what God asked him to do. And because of that, his heart had been absolutely captured by Yahweh. He had complete trust in Yahweh. To the point, uh, uh, in this whole story, there was a time where uh, God was calling him to do something, and, and, and Moses said, look, if you're not going to go before us, if you're not going to be in this with us, please don't send us. That's how much he trusted God. He knew. He knew it was God. He knew it wasn't him, but he knew it was God. He, his heart had been completely captured by God. He completely trusted God. He was passionate about God. Extremely passionate about God. Um, he, uh, you know, he feared God. He was the go-to between God and God's people. That was Moses. Moses stood in that gap. He was a, the, the deliverer. He delivered them out of Egypt, being led by God. He delivered them out of Egypt to Mount Sinai, to the presence of Yahweh Himself. He was the go, uh, again, the go-between uh, for the people and God. He was overcome by God. If you remember the story, I think it's a great story where he spent all this time, uh, he would go up on the mountain and God would spend time with Moses. And there was, the, there was a time where when Moses came back down off of the mountain, because he had been in the presence of God for, for such a time, the, the people looked at him and his face literally glowed. Glowed with the glory of God. To the point where the people put a veil over him because they were afraid of Moses. They were afraid to look at him. Talk about, talk about being overcome by God. To the point even too where Moses at one point would ask God, would you, you know, he was very enamored by the presence of God and Moses would even request, God, would you show me your face? In which God said, Moses, no one can see me. No human can see me and live. There's, you know, no one, no, no human can absorb that. But he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. And if you remember the story, he said, I will, I will hide you, 
or I'll put you in the in this crack, in this space in the rocks, and then I will walk by, I will put my hand over you, and I will walk by, and you can see my back. And that's what took place. Moses was a deliverer. So you go from someone, he again, the perfect candidate. He was the perfect candidate for the job. None of this is by coincidence. When God came to Moses, he knew. I mean, he knew Moses' life. He orchestrated his life. He ordained his life. Again, you're telling me that it's by chance, by coincidence, that his mother was summoned by the Pharaoh's daughter to be a midwife to help raise Moses? That's crazy to even I, that, that's crazy to even entertain that thought. It is it was not by chance whatsoever, not by coincidence whatsoever. It was by the divine hand of God orchestrating things in his upper story making Moses this perfect candidate. And so now, you know, his mom is raising him and the helping raising him. Uh, he's in the palace, but she's teaching him the Yahweh. Again, the God of Abraham, you know, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all the, you know, and, and she's teaching him the ways of Yahweh, not by coincidence, perfect candidate. And then he, he's a fugitive and a shepherd for 40 years in the exact area in which God is going to bring his people to. Again, it's not by coincidence. And then he's going to be the deliverer and he's going to be the go-between between the people, between God and his children. And Moses was absolutely overcome, enamored, passionate, completely trusting in God. Um, his heart was captured by God. Moses was the perfect candidate for the purpose in which God had for him. Here's the deal though. Moses was an ordinary individual. He even said it up front, who am I? That was the question, who am I? He was the perfect candidate. When God, but he was, but he was an ordinary person, an ordinary person just like you and I. And as God, as Moses, or as God would have, if you'd read the story, as God answered Moses, God's essentially telling him, I'm not asking you to do anything. I will do it through you. All you have to do is just follow. That's all I'm asking you to do is just follow. It's me that's going to do it all. And I'm paraphrasing that, summing it, you know, summarizing it up. But it's the same way with us. Moses was a hero. You're a hero. If you've placed your faith and trust into Jesus Christ, you are a hero that God has a purpose for and a calling. Whatever that may be, it's God's. It's God's for you. But God will do it through you. Moses was just an ordinary individual and he would have this, we have the same exact questions as he did. The same exact insecurities and fear as he did. But at some point, just like these other heroes that we're talking about, they trusted. They trusted and they followed God. The question is, do we, do you? Are you living out the calling in which God has for you? Are you a hero in which God has created you to be? I sure hope so. Would you this week spend a few moments reading through Exodus, maybe the first four chapters, and just kind of read that story once again and, and refresh it? Because I, again, uh, for time's sake, I'm just hitting on some points. But it's a great story of how Moses was called by God and even struggled a little bit there, but then truly followed. I, w I hope that you would spend just a few moments. Uh, and then I also hope that you're willing to be a hero in which God has created you to be. It's great being with you. I look forward to being with you next week.